So church, I have this message that God's dropped in my heart called guarding your sacrifice. Why would we want to guard our sacrifice? Because sacrifice means that you're all in. It means that you've poured your heart. I mean, everything about you is into this thing, man. You've given your effort, your time, your energy. And uh, the reason you want to guard it, because if it gets ruined or something happens, man, it is devastating. It is hard to take. One time I was on this job and uh, this contractor wanted to show me something and so there's, well, not only me, but there was a group of guys. And so we're walking out and there was this poor guy, man. He was out there smoothing out this freshly poured concrete. It looked beautiful. But unbeknownst to him, man, there was a big old powwow, big group coming out. And we walked out of the door and everybody trampled right through his freshly poured concrete. Man, <laughs> to say the guy was fired up, that's an understatement. <laughs> Have you ever seen those people that are carrying a big wedding cake out on those videos? You know, they're coming out and you can see it's heavy, but it's, you know, they poured their heart into it. The great sacrifice, you know, every little detail, every little flower, everything looks beautiful. And then the poor guy trips, boom, and the cake just lands on the table and, you know, splats on the floor. It's just, it's devastating. Why? Because they went all in. They made great sacrifice to create something beautiful only to have it ruined. So we want to guard that. One day, Veronica and I, we were ministering at a church and we have a friend and she comes in and she has tears just streaming down her face. And, you know, it's obvious something really bad happened. And she comes in, she's like, she's like, guys, like, oh, man. She's like, somebody stole my computer out of my car right now. And she's just devastated. And we're thinking, okay, well, we, we can help you get a new computer. She's like, no, you don't understand. She's like, God put a, a book on my heart, and I've been writing it and writing it for months now. And I've put everything that I've got into it. And I said, well, do you have anything? Is it backed up? She's like, no, that's the problem. It was on the computer, and it's gone. And guys, it was almost like... We wanted to cry with her. It was like, oh my gosh, because she had gone all in. She had sacrificed so much to write that book. And like that, it was ruined. It was gone. And, um, you know, in the same way, you know, it happens to you and it happens to me that when we decide to go all in, we're, it's really, it's risky. Why? Because we're putting everything that we've got into a relationship, maybe. Maybe we're putting it into a career, maybe into a ministry. And when you go all in, man, it's a huge risk. And I want to talk to you today about guarding your sacrifice. The things that you submit to God, the things that you're handing over to Him, you know, it's worth us guarding those things. And so I want to take you into this passage of Scripture in Genesis. So if you would, go with me to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to read about a man named Abram, okay? And uh, this is, you know, which we know in the Bible, after he cuts covenant with God, he ends up changing his name to Abraham. So some of you may know him as Abraham, you know, the father of many, but this guy started out as Abram. And so let's go ahead and pick this up. You know, chapter 15, verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And so what God is saying is, Hey, don't fear anything, Abram. I've got your back. And what he's saying is, I'm going to bless you greatly. And his response is really interesting, though, because Abram responds to him, and he basically says this, why would you bless me greatly if I don't have anybody to leave it to? It's kind of like he's saying is like, why would you waste blessing me? I don't have a son. But see, God knew that, that above all that Abram and Sarai or Abraham and Sarah, they wanted to have a son, a descendant of their own. And this is the amazing thing is that God, he knows your heart. He knows the things that you desire more than anything. And we see from this that God wants to bless you. God wanted to bless him. And so we're going to learn how to get into that flow. And so in verse five, we pick up and it says, then he brought him. So as speaking, God brought Abram outside and said, look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And so God is saying, listen, I know the intent of your heart. I know the thing that would just 
make your heart explode. And God is so ready and so willing to do that for this guy. And he says, you know, not only do you, are you going to have a son? He says, but look up to the heavens. Look at heaven. Look at all the stars. He says, so will be all your descendants. I mean, God is just saying, I'm going to pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain, man. This is going to be incredible. But let's pick up in verse six, because I love this. And it says, then he believed in the Lord and he, capital H, meaning God, accounted it to him for righteousness. See, some of you, you're standing on a promise. God has promised you something. God has promised you a child. God has promised you that your wayward child will come home. God has promised you a spouse. God has promised you maybe a specific career or a specific ministry. There's a dream that is in your heart that you know that it's going to exceed all expectations. And you've put your trust and your faith in God. You're saying, God, I'm believing you for it. And I want you to know that God, as you put your faith in him, he's accounting it as righteousness. And he's going to do it, guys. I want you to know that I've come with good news today. He's going to do it. But I love what, what Abram says after. After God says, hey, I've accounted it to him as righteousness. And, it says, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it. So it's kind of like you saying, okay, I believe you, but how am I going to really know like that, you know, the promise is true, that I'll have a son, that I'll have these descendants. And God institutes something, and I love this. He shows him how to make a sacrifice. He's showing him how to enter covenant with God. And so in verse nine, so he said to him, bring me three, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to cut to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. It says, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. I want you to see something that's really interesting here. So here God is showing Abram how to make a sacrifice one that honors God. But what you may have not caught right there is what happens in verse 11. And I want to pick that up today about guarding your sacrifice. Because it says, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. I want you to know that whenever there's a sacrifice made, that vultures are going to (laughs) appear. When there's a sacrifice made, there is blood that is present, man. Wherever there's there's a sacrifice, wherever there's blood, man, the vultures are going to appear appear. And what I want you to know that today that you're going to have to, if you're going to stand in faith and you're going to stand firm in the promise that God has given you, the thing that you're holding on to, you are going to have to know that the vultures are going to begin to circle and then they're going to begin to attack the sacrifice that you made. But I love what it says right here at the end of verse 11. It says, but Abram drove them away. You're going to have to be committed to driving these dang vultures away from the sacrifice that you've made. Because see, here's the interesting thing. I like to call it being in vision mode. See, when God gave him the vision at first, and he took him out on the star walk and showed him and said, hey, your descendants will be like the stars in the heavens. Listen, that's what I like to call vision mode. And see, and when we get a vision for something, when God gives you a promise or you're believing for something, you're believing for a relationship to resurrect and come back together, you're believing for that open opportunity with a job, whatever it is, believing for your first home or maybe a new home, whatever it is that God has dropped that promise in your heart, you have to know that, man, when you're on that star walk moment, when you're in vision mode, all things seem possible, man. It is exciting. And you're like, yeah, come on, let's go, God. But then when it comes to making a sacrifice, that's your first step. And you can rest assured that although in the vision mode, you didn't see the vultures circling, but they were there. And the second you make that sacrifice and say, God, I'm all in, and you start making those steps, when you sign on that line and sign that student loan for your college career, when you sign those documents for that house and you're shaking inside, like, oh, I'm so excited, but yet you're like, oh man, like, how are we gonna pay for this house? What happens if I lose my job? You know, all these things start coming at you. That is the attack. That is the vultures coming at you as soon as there is a sacrifice made because we make the sacrifice in faith. And those vultures are sent from the enemy to attack 
the sacrifice and the covenant that you've made with God. I hope that you're getting something out of this today. See, because when we make sacrifices, I mentioned before, the, ver- the vultures circle, but also there's blood present. There's just certain things, I don't know, that they just, they just know that there's death and that there's, there's potential for this thing dying. Because see, I want you to know that if we step out of faith, the dream begins to die, it begins to fade. That when, when we start to lose hope, when we stop putting our trust in God, that very promise that he gave you, the vultures are circling just hoping that it's going to die. That, that say you were called to plant a church and you stepped out in faith, but then all of a sudden you got fearful and you started backing off. The vultures are like, yes, yes, it's dying. And they're just waiting for that thing to die to pounce on it. You know, one time we were at a beach <laughs> and uh, we saw a vulture, man. I've seen seagulls. I've seen, um, you know, pelicans at beaches. I was going to say penguins. I've never seen a penguin at a beach, but... <laughs> But we've seen those kind of birds, but I've never seen a vulture. And I remember we were at this beach and all of a sudden, man, this big, you know, they're big and they're gnarly looking and he lands and he's just like picking at something. And then all of a sudden another one lands and they start squabbling with each other. And I looked up like this and I saw there was a gang of them, man, and they were just circling around. Why? Because they can sense death. They can sense when something is dying and they're actually hoping for it. And I believe that the enemy, he wants to send vultures into your life in, in hopes that your dreams and that the promise that God has given you, that you are just, you know, he's hoping that he can discourage you and back you off of the promise of God and let that thing die so the vultures can feast on your sacrifice. But I'm here today to tell you that there is a way out and you're going to have to be tenacious like Abram was, man. He was driving them out. Get out of here. Get out of here. If you've ever seen vultures, man, they're tenacious. You like swing a stick at them and they'll come right back. You know, (laughs) you swing a stick over here and they'll come right back. But it says that Abram, that he was relentless, that he guarded his sacrifice and he kept fighting and fighting and fighting. It said all the way until even the sun went down, he was not gonna allow the vultures to steal his sacrifice. And so today I wanna talk to you about three vultures that come to steal your sacrifice and you're gonna have to drive them out. And so number one is this, is the vulture of doubt, the vulture of doubt. See, often when we are in vision mode and we're seeing like what it can be, man, we are really excited about it. But as I mentioned, when you take that first step out to embrace what God wants to do in your life, that vulture of doubt is gonna land and he's probably gonna land right on your shoulder and he's gonna be screaming in your ear. Just like, no, this can't be God. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe it's not God. You know what? I mean, you stepped out in faith, but I think maybe you missed him. And you're going to have this thing just, I don't know if that's the noise they make. But anyways, (laughs) he's in your ear, just, you know, just getting all up in your your space and causing doubt. See, like when we envisioned Hub City Church, I saw a church full of people. I saw a church that was changing a city. I saw a church where there were families coming to the Lord together. I saw relationships that were being restored. I saw a vibrant community full of life and people that were pursuing the things of God with reckless abandonment. And there were natural things that I saw too. I saw that as people were pulling into the parking lot, that people were excited and they were waving. I saw a worship experience that gave honor and glory to God, but that was alive and vibrant, that our praises as they were lifted up, that people like joy was in the house. And I remember as we began to set out to plant this church, See, the vision state, the vision mode was exciting. But man, that first step, all of a sudden, the vultures started circling, Veronica, in my life. My health was attacked. Our money got funny, man. Relationships got weird. Not everybody was excited about Hub City Church being planted. And there were things that, these, that, the, that the vultures started circling and they were coming and landing on my shoulder and saying, maybe, you're, maybe you miss God. Maybe this isn't God. Maybe, maybe you should just go back to where you were before. Maybe you should just settle for what you were doing because this is huge. This is so big for you guys. 
You've got a name in a city, but you've got no team. You've got no money. Like, how are you going to do this? And all of a sudden, it was like these, these things were coming down, trying to, you know, steal our sacrifice and back us off from planting the church that God put in our heart, from pursuing the promise that he called us to. And these things were circling. I'm telling you, man, some days they were circling so much. There were so many of them. It just seemed like we had like permanent shade. <laughs> it was like just a shade above, man. They were blocking out the sun because there were so many of them. And I'd venture to say that some of you, that's how you've experienced life lately, is that you know that God has given you a promise, but the voice in your ear is so loud and it is shouting to you that this is not God. Maybe you've missed him. And what I want to say to you today is that you're going to have to drive them away. You're going to have to stand up in faith and say, get out of here. This is not the truth. The truth is that God has given me a promise. The truth is found in his word, not in what you're saying to me. And you're going to have to become tenacious about fighting them off. You know, it's really interesting in Luke chapter 17, verse 19. You know, we, uh, we see John the Baptist and those of you that, you, most of you know who John the Baptist was, but he was the one that was telling of Jesus, man. This dude was amazing. He was like a prophet. But you see him, and as Jesus lands in the town, even he has questions. John the Baptist, and this is what he says. He says that he sends a few guys in Luke seven nineteen. It says, and he sent them to the Lord to ask him, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? See, in his own heart, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he wasn't sure. He's like, am I, am I missing? Like, okay, wait, I think it's him, but I'm not really sure. And what I'm, what I'm seeing here is that that's how we're going to live at times, is that you get a promise and you're like, um, uh, I'm not really sure. But, uh. but you know what I love here is that Jesus silenced the vultures in John's life. The, the vultures that were in his ear saying, wait, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's not the Messiah. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. No, you're missing it. No, you're reading him wrong. He's not the guy. Wait, wait, he is the guy. A lot of confusion and Jesus silences the vultures in his life. And what he does is with the guys that John the Baptist sent, he says, watch what I'm about to do. And he does miracles. And then he tells him, he says, go back and tell him the things that you've seen and the things that you've heard. And he silenced the vultures in his life. And I want to tell you today that Jesus wants to silence the vultures of doubt in your life. That he wants you to be convinced that he is good and that his plans for you are good. And see, and here's the tragedy that often that when we give way to the vultures of doubt and they start picking at your sacrifice and taking pieces of it and running away with it, it won't be long before you start speaking vulture. I want you to know today that you have to forbid yourself from speaking vulture in your life. It is the very thing that will attack your faith. And you have to forbid other people of speaking vulture in your life. See, as that thing is speaking doubt into you on your shoulder, sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, it's all bad. Your church is falling apart. You guys, you know, you thought that you were going to do live services. Now you've been online for over seven months. How's this going to work? How's God going to grow your church? And these things are attacking the vision. They're attacking the promise that God gave us for Hub City. And the one thing that we refuse to do is to agree with the vultures. I will not allow those things to come out of my mouth and say, oh, yeah, we're doomed, man. Church is over, man. We've lost everybody. Look, we're online. God's not even doing anything. Is anybody even watching this? We will not allow ourselves to speak vulture. We will speak what Christ speaks. We will speak in faith. We will speak of his goodness. We will speak of his mercy. We will speak of God's faithfulness at all times. That is what will come out of our mouth. And I want to encourage you today that if your doubt is being attacked by the vultures of doubt, you silence them and you send them packing by faith. So number two is the vulture of delay. Okay, so number one is we've got the vulture of doubt that we've got to contend with. We are not going to let that vulture steal our sacrifice. But number two is the vulture of delay. See, what we have to see is that Abram, he cut 
he made, made sacrifice, but those things were laying there. Those animals were laying there long enough for the vultures to want to swoop in and eat them. You guys know that vultures don't eat live things, right? They eat dead things. And so it, there was a process. There was time. You know, it's not like, you know, Abram, you know, cut, you know, boom, separated them, and then God just came down with the fire, consumed his sacrifice. It didn't happen like that. It would have been great if it did, but there was a delay in that. And the delay was is that all day long he is out there and he's driving these vultures away all day long, all the way until the time of the sun going down. And that in life, you and I, we are going to experience these delays that come our way. And God is giving you the promise and you're holding on to it. But man, it is taking forever. I don't know why it is, but it seems that at times that, that God's like, his timing's like dog years. <laughs> Sometimes we're like, Man, I've been believing in God. It feels like it's been five years that I need breakthrough. And God's like, well, actually, it's only been like three months. <laughs> it's like, well, it feels like five years. You know, why do we got to have this dog year, you know, type thing? But, but it's hard waiting during times of delay. And, you know, when you look around, and, and this, this is the trap, and this is the danger of allowing the vulture of delay to sit on your sacrifice is that one is it'll discourage you, and two, it'll sink you into a place of comparison. See, when you have a promise and God promised you a spouse, but it's taking longer, you look around and you're like, all my friends are all married and I'm not. So you sink into this comparison and the vulture starts eating your sacrifice, oh, taking pieces and flying away with it. You know, some of you, you know, you're like, wow, you know, I've, I believe in starting a business and your business is growing super, super slow. But then this cat down the street, man, just started and bam, you know, it's like, he's just like, his business is exploding. And you're like, whoa, like, but that's my promise. And, and you start to compare yourself. Why? Because of the, the, the delays. It's the same thing. You know, most people, they'll start a ministry and they're like, yeah, you know, by three months, we should be up to a thousand people. And, you know, you've been pastoring the same people for, you know, 40, 50 people for the last year and a half. You know what? We cannot compare ourselves to other people. And let me say this, that delays that are happening, that there are, things are going to take longer than you've expected. Why? Because God's not so concerned in developing the outside. He's more concerned with developing the inside first. And we have to be willing to yield ourselves and to put that very thing, that very altar, the very promise on the altar and say, God, I surrender and I submit this to you. And not only this thing, but it's timing, God. And I refuse to give in to the vultures of delay that as they come and they sit on my shoulder and they start speaking things, you're missing things. It's even harder when you see the things that you love and that you poured your whole heart into, you see them slipping out of your hands. Naturally, our tendencies, we're going to want to grab them and control things. But God has called us to relinquish control and to trust him. You know, there's a story of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And he literally, because of the vultures of delay, he ruined his lineage and his heritage. He lost his entire kingdom because he didn't handle the vulture of delay properly. See, in verse 8, you see that the Philistines are pressing the, the Israelites, the army of Israel and Saul and his son. They're pressing them from all sides. And what's happening is that his army is starting to grow weary and they're starting to leave. They're like, man, we got to get out of here. And they're, they're, they're bolting. You know, they're turning their back on him. And, and Saul, he, he's starting to grow weary. And, and he's like, wait a minute, but if my army leaves, how are we going to fight them? Because we're losing guys day by day. But he was told by the prophet Samuel to wait. Wait, don't go into battle till I get there. And I'm going to do a burnt offering and a peace offering before the Lord. And then you guys go. But it takes seven days. And Saul gets really impatient. So on the seventh day, he ends up just saying, you know what? Just give me the stuff and I'll make the, I'll make the sacrifices. And so check this out. We're going to pick up in 1 Samuel 13, 10 through 13. It says, just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet him and welcome him. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? And Saul replied, 
I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would, and the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. You see that the vulture of delay got into Saul. You know, God had promised them they would be a great nation. God had promised them that he, his kingdom would last. God had made promises to Saul. But Saul listened to the vulture of delay. And he went, he was disobedient, and he offered up a sacrifice that he was not authorized to offer. Listen to verse 13. He says, how foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Ouch. The vulture delay ate his sacrifice and flew off with it. And his promise died in that, in that moment. His kingdom would have lasted forever, but now we know that the kingdom of David, his successor, the one who took his place, lasts forever. Why? Because he didn't handle the vulture of delay properly. And you just have to understand, my friends, that wherever you find yourself waiting on that promise, you have to have a heart to just say, you know what, God? It's not happening in my time, but I'll wait. I will wait and I will keep fighting off the vulture of delay. When it comes, I will fight it off. I refuse to compare myself to somebody else. I refuse to take my timeline and force it on somebody else or take somebody else's timeline and force it into my situation. God, whatever it is that you have for me, I will embrace it and I will keep standing right here. I will be faithful to not move from this place, God, because you told me to stand here in faith. I will stand here. I will not move. I will not leave. I will not try to make my own way, but I will trust you as I drive off the vulture of delay. Are you guys ready for number three? Here's our last one. Number three is the vulture of distraction. So we have the vulture of doubt the vulture of delay, and then we have the vulture of distraction. These are what are coming to devour your sacrifice. But your sacrifice is the thing that makes you in covenant with God, which unleashes the blessing of God. And the enemy does not want you blessed. He does not want you in covenant with God. He wants to steal your sacrifice. Listen to vulture, the vulture of distraction. Is that when God has called us to be faithful to something, the enemy is always going to send a distraction our way. You know, I, I often I see people on, on, on the freeway, you know, and they end up in a bad accident. Veronica and I, we, it wasn't a bad accident, but we got rear-ended a couple weeks ago. And, um, and the guy just totally, you know, boom, hits us. We pull over, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth, he says, dude, I'm so sorry, I got distracted. He goes, I, I, was, I was distracted with something. I, I thought you guys went and you didn't. Distraction is the very thing that can actually cause crashes and calamity in your life. It could be the very thing that crashes and destroys your sacrifice because we get, you know, we get off base, man. It's like, whoop, we're, we should be looking this way. We're over there, you know, staring out into whatever. But the enemy, often with distractions, he's not gonna distract you with things that are overtly or just blatantly bad. Often it's gonna be great things. It's gonna be great opportunities, but it's not God's best for you. You know, I see that, you know, that some people, they'll step out for, you know, a diet like me. Man, I've been on diets a bunch of times and it's kind of the distraction, the vulture distraction is like a Twinkie. <laughs> that sucker just flies in whoop, and you're like, oh, hey, whoa, man, this is yummy. <laughs> That's how distractions often are. They're not things that you detest. They're things that you may even be pursuing, but they're not the things of God. They're not things that allow you to stay all in and engage with God's plan and purpose for your life. They're actually things that if you were to actually get those things, it would actually pull you away from the things of God. Sometimes they come in form of money. Sometimes they come in the form of business 
promotions, hobbies, relationships, and pursuits that are outside of the will of God. And that vulture, it shows up and, and, it, and it's a distraction to the plan and purpose of God. And what it's really seeking to do is to get your priorities out of whack. It's to get things that should be low level, lesser things. And the enemy's trying to move those things into position of greater things. But there should never be anything that is, is our focus and our prize more than the presence of God and our relationship with him. And the enemy wants to rearrange and constantly reprioritize things. And I've watched this happen so many times where somebody loved God, pursued God. God gave them a promise of a successful business, but the success actually became the very thing that attacked the promise and the relationship with God. And at some point, they're no longer serving God. They're serving the business that God gave them. I know this is kind of real for some of you, but I just want you to know that you have to be careful with the pursuits that you have because sometimes those passions, you know, can actually begin to outweigh and become more of a, of a thing that we pursue than even our relationship with God. They are distractions. See, Jesus was familiar with this in Luke chapter four, verse five through eight. Here we know that Jesus came, you know, to this earth to die on our behalf. That was his sacrifice. His sacrifice was to die for all of humanity, to win us back, to be a bridge back to the Father, a broken people connected with a perfect God. And so he comes with a great mission, ready to make the ultimate sacrifice. And we see in Luke chapter four, verses five through eight, he's being tempted by the devil. And it says, then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So he just, he shows him all these great things here on this earth. And it says, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And so we see right here that Jesus comes on assignment from the Father, given a promise that if he walks out his sacrifice, that all of humanity will have an opportunity to be saved. Talk about a huge call. Talk about a huge promise, a great plan. And we see the enemy and he's trying to get in the middle of it. The vultures of distraction are circling Jesus and they're wanting to swoop down and to steal his sacrifice. But listen to what Jesus says in verse eight. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Or only you shall serve. Listen, he made it really clear in that moment that the distraction of these worldly riches and people honoring him and praising him and bowing down to him at that moment. Although maybe some of us would be like, man, that would be great, man. That's awesome. But the enemy, the vultures were trying to steal his sacrifice. And I think what would have happened if Jesus had given into that in that moment? What would the ramifications have been? you and I would not have the ability to be connected to the Father. And in the same way, what is it that we're called to that is gonna connect other people to the Father? What is it the things that God has promised you that has put you on mission for the kingdom of God that maybe right now the enemy is trying to swoop down into your life and create distraction to pull you away from those things, which will set off a chain reaction of you missing God and the people that he's purposed in your life, them missing God and God having to use somebody else. It's not worth it, my friend. It's not worth being distracted. And that's why in Luke 9, 23, it says, then he said to them, this, this is Jesus speaking. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That couples with the other verse where it just says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. I only want to serve God. I don't want to be distracted with the things of this world, with the riches and the foods and the things that are enticing me to be drawn away to think only of this world. But I want to live in a way to where I'm beating and fighting off the vultures of distraction. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get off of my sacrifice that I've given to God. We have given him our lives. We are loyal to him and to him only. And having a mindset of saying daily, 
I will take up my cross. In Jesus, I'm following you. Wherever you're going, I, I am with you. Whatever you want me to do, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to do it. Whatever you want me to say, I'm going to say it. Whatever, whoever you want me to reach, I'm going to reach him. And I refuse to be distracted. I f- refuse to give way to these vultures that are coming in and trying to steal my sacrifice. And so today, I ask you the question, has there been doubt, the vultures of doubt, sitting on your shoulder, speaking into you, and have you been giving in to those or have you been driving them away? To some of you, the vultures of delay have been circling and you're feeling this panic inside, like you need to do something. You know, just as Saul, as his army was leaving, you feel like everything that you've been holding on tight to, you feel like it's just, it's evaporating, it's, it's leaving you, and you're trying to hang on to it tighter. Let me say to you today, relinquish control and just trust in God. And you will see those vultures scatter. And today, have you been distracted? Are there things that are pulling at you that are moving and driving you away from the things of God? I want you to know that today by his grace and his power, you can say no to lesser things and say yes to greater things. Let God empower you to drive away those things that entice you and that are pulling at you today.